welcome to another video. Today we're doing my August wrap up, which means that the summer kind of over. We're gonna put quotation marks around that because you never know what September can bring. There's been many of a heat wave hitting in September. I've been able to have my last few days sat outside in the sun reading because I haven't been able to do that for about a month. So I have missed the sun and my reading out in the sun. But I am looking forward to autumn. I do really enjoy autumn. Summer is my favourite month. Oh, that's not a month. It's a season. Summer is my favourite season. But I do really enjoy the cosy days that autumn brings as well. I just tend to find I read a little bit more in summer, which is very topical because today we are wrapping up all of the books I read in August in a super speedy wrap up where I throw books at myself, talk really fast about them and just try and keep it short and sweet and snappy because it has to be, because I read 12 books. <sighs> I don't really know how this has happened, but it's it's happened. So I have got my core pile up, which is how I rate my books. It is a system created by G from Book Roast. If you wanna check it out, search core pile on the YouTube search bar and it will show you how she reviews her books using this template. So I've got all my core pile reviews and ratings here. Got my books. There's a lot. I need to stop doing this to myself because it's just a lot to wrap up. And actually, looking at this, this is the month I seemed to get caught up with some series, which I'm kind of proud of myself for. So I'm going to throw books at myself, tell you what I thought of them. Let's do this. First up, I read Siege and Storm by Lee Bardugo. This is the second book in the, whatever this world is called, Shadowhunters? Shadow and Bone trilogy. The Shadowhunters, that's the wrong author. Okay, we're just gonna, yeah. This book is in the Shadow and Bone trilogy, not the Shadowhunters trilogy, which isn't even a trilogy. Shadow and Bone. And I gave this three out of five stars because honestly, this series just doesn't really wow me. I think maybe if I'd have read it sooner when I was younger, maybe it would have got me a little bit more. It is very typical YA. It's a fantasy. It's got the epic moments. It's got the romance. It's got the sacrifices and the betrayals and all of that kind of thing. But for me, it just didn't quite hit it. I think for me, the best character in this series is Nikolai. And for, by far, he just takes the reins for me. So any other character in this whole series, because I will be talking about another book in this series in a moment, just takes a back seat. So Nikolai basically brings this series home for me and I can't even remember which book he comes into it at. Is he in this book? I don't, <laughs> I don't know, they all rolled into one. So I read Siege and Storm by Lee Bardugo. It was okay, it was pretty typical YA and I gave it three stars. Then I read Ruin and Rising by Lee Bardugo and I gave it three stars. <laughs> This one definitely has Nikolai in it. The, the, other, the other one must have Nikolai in it too. I, I don't know, but basically we're just gonna rate this on a scale of how often Nikolai is in these books. So <laughs> this one was very similar to the second one. I think I read them back to back, like literally as soon as I finished one, I immediately started the next one. I did them as audiobooks, so it was quite easy to do that. So that's why they're kind of blending into one for me. But yeah, I generally felt the same about this one as I did Siege and Storm. It was a good conclusion, but I felt like at one point the information was just kind of being dumped quite quickly, whereas the rest of the book felt a lot slower. Like to start with, it felt a lot slower and then everything seemed to happen at the end. And I felt like maybe that could have been spaced out a little bit more and we could have had more detail at the end and less at the start. But do you know what? I can't complain. It was a pretty average YA. Again, three stars. I'm really sorry for everyone that absolutely loves this series. I don't dislike it. I just think maybe it wasn't quite the right time for me to read it. But point being, I have now finished this trilogy. And it wasn't the Shadowhunters trilogy, it was the Shadow and Bone trilogy. Then I read The House in the Cerulean Sea by TJ Klune. I read this for a dedicated reading vlog for my Patreon, so they picked the book I read and then this was the one I made a special reading vlog for. And oh my gosh, I loved this. It was so wholesome, it was so cute, it was so quaint. It had such lovely characters in it. I absolutely loved getting to know these children and seeing how they all formed relationships with each other. Very much a found family story with a really lovely intertwining fantasy element to it that just felt natural and a part of this story. So I really, really enjoyed this one and I really enjoyed the journey of following somebody who had one view of the world and they are basically sent to an orphanage to assess it and see whether it's safe and whether it should be shut down. And they have one view going in and then they kind of come out with a very different perspective on everything. And I think that is such a great message and I just loved it. So this one got five out of five stars. Then I read As Good As Dead by Holly Jackson. Now, 
this book I had such high hopes for. This is the third in the Good Girl's Guide to Murder trilogy, so it is the last book. I have absolutely loved the first two in that trilogy, like definitely a favourite series for me. Now this book, it came out as a four stars. I was really disappointed by this book. Now whilst it has come out as a four stars, that is because I still really enjoyed the writing, I still really enjoyed the characters, and I love everything about this world and the little Kilton setting. However, what happened in this book really frustrated me. I'm not going to give any spoilers, but there was something that happened that just felt so out of place and just so wrong as a conclusion for these characters. There seemed to be no remorse, there just seemed to be nothing logical to it. And I know, yes, it's fiction and it doesn't have to follow any line of logic if it doesn't want to, but the world that these books have established them in is one that does follow logic and remorse and a reason behind things and it just felt like this one left that at the door which was such a shame because I think Pip deserved better and I feel awful saying that because I love this series but this one did frustrate me. I still enjoyed it enough to give it four stars because as I said everything else I loved but just what happened at the latter half of this book still gave me goosebumps, still made me like ooh I need to know what's happening didn't mean I liked what was happening, so feel bad about this one, but it, it's torn me in half, it really has, in the, I just don't know how I feel about it, so we're just gonna sit there on the four star shelf. <laughs> then I read The Exact Opposite of OK by Laura Stephen, and this was <laughs> rubbish. I feel so bad when I say I don't like books, I just feel such guilt for it, because someone is sitting down, sit, sitting down, I mean, that I can't really talk about writing if I say sitting down, can I? Someone has sat down and wrote this and put all of their effort into it and all of their heart and passion and soul into it. And I'm saying I don't like it, so I always feel tremendous guilt, but at the same time, I'm here to give you my opinions on books. So guilt aside, I didn't like this for many reasons. It was meant to be a feminist novel. It was meant to be empowering. It's about a girl who has photos shared online about her that are not appropriate photos that she would want shared online. She's at school. None of the teachers do anything about this. No one steps in, no one takes it seriously, nobody. I would understand if that was one teacher's role and they were there to demonstrate the fact that you don't get listened to, but literally nobody, nobody took this seriously. That was annoying. Also, feminist novel, really empowering, someone that is sex and body positive, is calling their genitalia by stupid pet names that just made me cringe. And I just felt like this novel had a really great opportunity to be open and open up a line of conversation about this kind of thing without having that taboo in there. And I think that having reflected on this, I think that it could have either been done deliberately, where it's highlighting the taboo and it's saying that this is how people refer to genitalia with pet names because there's a taboo there and it makes us feel like we can't say actual words for things. But I don't think it was doing that. I think it was just genuinely calling a vulva a foofy or a foofa, whatever it was. I think it was a foofa and things like that. And it just, no. And also the thing that bugged me was that a penis was called a penis, but a vulva was not called a vulva. And it was like, there was that divide there as well. And yeah, just, there was a lot that I had when I was <laughs> reading this book and thinking about it. Again, there's more th thoughts of this one in my reading vlog as well, but mm, two stars, two stars guys, not good. Then I read Ace of Spades by Farida Abiki Iamidi, and this one is a YA thrillery mystery. Takes a long time to get going, I would say, and for that reason, it didn't completely grip me, and that is why I ended up giving this one a four, not a five out of five stars, because I felt like the first 200 to 250 pages were just immensely slow, and I felt like I really needed something to happen. Then the last, like, 100 or so pages were really fast-paced, and I just needed it to give me a little bit more, so it was almost most like they needed to just kind of combine the two of those and just make the start of it a lot snappier and the end of it still really action-packed and as fast-paced as it was but just give a little bit more description for the why at the end of it all but I think this book raises some very very important conversations I don't want to give any spoilers because if you don't know what this is or what those important conversations are I don't want that to seem like it's a spoiler so that is all I'm gonna say on this but I think it certainly left me shocked when the middle part happened. It's so hard to talk about thrillers without giving spoilers for them. But yeah, all you need to know is this talks about some really important conversations that I'm not gonna tell you what they are. Definitely has some shocking moments, definitely has some gripping twists and turns, but was definitely slow to get going. But once it got going, it was pretty decent and 
pretty compelling. So four stars, could have been five if it was a little bit more fast paced at the start, I think. Then I read The Tea Dragon Tapestry by Kay O'Neill. This is set within the Tea Dragon Society world. That is just so cute. These are graphic novels. They are absolutely lovely. They just follow such nice, quaint stories that are people's lives, different messages in each one. This one's message was very much about how, like, you can accept yourself and everyone's on different paths and, you know, finding out who you really are and how it's okay that you've changed throughout your life's journey. And it just was so, so lovely. I absolutely adored it. I gave it four stars. It's a really cute little graphic novel world. I don't know if this is the last one or if we'll see more. I hope we see more. But yeah, if you want something really cute and quaint and just really lovely and probably perfect for autumn, I would really recommend this series. Then I read Cat Dunn's Dangerous Remedy and whew, this is probably a new favourite. I absolutely loved it. This was so, so good. It is set within the French Revolution in the late 1700s in France and it follows a group of people that are basically dedicated to breaking people out of prison or on their way to the gallows to save as many lives as they possibly can and it follows their journey and the particular person that they've had to go and break out of prison that has a little bit more to them than they were actually told. So oh, we have an established found family already, we have an amazing band of characters, we have so much wit and humour. I really enjoyed the fact that this book didn't necessarily focus entirely on the romance. We have Camille and we have Ada and whilst we get their, both of their perspectives in each chapter and we see how they feel about each other and we see their passion and their love and we see the struggles there, it doesn't feel like it's just about their romance, it feels like it's such a bigger scale than that and there's so many epic moments and just oh so many epic moments you will just live constantly in fear that you're just gonna see someone die that you don't want to die. It's just what I really appreciate about this book is it jumped immediately into the action, there was no messing about, there was nothing there that made me think like oh this is too slow or what, when's this going to get going, it was immediately in. But it did it in a really clever way, they immediately established the characters in the setting and what their relationship was with each other and we immediately cared about them and there was nothing that made me think this has gone in too fast and it's not given me enough time to build a connection with these characters. I felt immediately connected to them and that made me very happy and also very much compelled to keep reading. So I bloody love this book, so so good, five stars, also has absolutely lyrical and beautiful writing so it has everything. It's just so good, so so good. Then I read The Little Shop of Found Things by Paula Braxton. This is a historical slash modern day fiction about a woman who travels back in time to the 1600s. She doesn't really know why but she has some kind of a link there through an antique item that she has picked up and her and her mum own an antique shop in modern day and they live in Marlborough which is why I picked this one up because this was a fictionary prompt for somewhere I had been and that is a town quite nearby to me so I definitely knew the setting very well and it definitely kept establishing that setting quite a lot so it felt like it was really rooted in an area that I knew. I would say though that this was just kind of a slow quaint story so it didn't really grip me and pull me in in the way something like Dangerous Remedy did for example but it was quite an easy listening audiobook. It definitely gave me Outlander vibes so I'd say if you liked Outlander you would probably quite enjoy this one. I think there were probably avenues that this could have picked up on a little bit more but it's okay, it did work, it, it worked, it just didn't absolutely enthrall me but I thought it was a nice cute story and I'm quite pleased with myself for reading this one because this is definitely outside of my normal comfort zone of what I would read. So I gave this one three out of five stars. Then I read Defy the Night, which is Bridget Kemmerer's new book that comes out in September this month. This was sent to me by Bloomsbury for an early review copy. So I read this one last month and I was, I, I went into this kind of unknowingly what I was gonna expect and I have to say that at the start, I was thinking, oh, this is gonna be really typical YA and I kind of judged it too soon and was finding it quite slow and it wasn't really gripping me and I just felt like it was all very predictable. And then something happened that I didn't see coming and I was like, oh, okay, I'm back on the bandwagon. So I actually really quite enjoyed this one and I enjoyed following the story of two people who were kind of in a Robin Hood situation in which there is an illness plaguing everybody, like there's no differentiation between who it touches and there is a cure or medicine to help prevent this illness. So 
the people we follow in this book are trying to take that medicine from the rich and give it to the poor. So it's kind of Robin Hood-esque, but there's a lot more to it than that. And there's a whole like political side of it kind of as well, but not in a heavy way. So I quite enjoyed the character dynamics here. I quite enjoyed the fantasy romance side of it. And yeah, it was, it was fun. It was good fun. This came out as four out of five stars. Then I read Quicksand by Junichiro Tanizaki, and this is a very short psychological thriller Japanese classic that follows a woman who is going to an art school, meets another woman, has an affair with her, then her husband gets involved, and it just becomes a big story of manipulation, basically. This is all about each character manipulating each character, and like they will take turns to stir the pot and just become a train wreck of manipulation. And it was very clever in that sense. I would say that I thought this was going to be a lot more intense than it was, because it says it's a psychological thriller. I was expecting that aspect a lot more, and personally I didn't really get that from it, but it was still an interesting story and I had a lot to say about this as I was reading it. I wrote quite a lot of notes within the pages of this book talking about the manipulation and the way that we see each character in a different light as the book goes on, which I thought was very clever. So whilst I did enjoy this one, I ended up giving it three out of five stars because it didn't quite hit the mark for me. It was fun to experience the characters' journeys and see how they all played off against each other, but that was probably about it for me. It just it was okay. It was alright. I wrote quite a lot of notes as I was reading it, but yeah, it was, I just, maybe if I read it again I would take a little bit more from it. Now I know the kind of journey it's going to go on, but yeah, three out of five stars. And finally, I have finished Monsters Designed by Cat Down, which is book two in this trilogy. I cannot wait for book three. I can't really tell you what this one is about because obviously that would spoil book two, but it continues to follow our characters that we met in the first book on the continuation of their journey, like literally picking straight up from the end of the first book and what the hell is happening there with them and the path that they must take in order to do what they believe is the right thing. And I found this very thrilling, very epic again, full with humour. I kept taking pictures of each page with the app I'm using to make notes on because I just absolutely kept cracking up at some of the humour. Al in both of these books is such a good character. He's got such dry wit. I absolutely adore him. I am really, really needing to read the third book, which isn't out yet, but I very much want to read that because I need to see how this all comes together and how it ends because the way this one ended things, I have a need. So this came out as 4.5 out of 5. I didn't quite enjoy it as much as the first one, but it was very, very, very close. Oh my gosh, I read so many books. Oh, I love reading loads of books in a month that makes me feel very productive, but at the same time, doing the wrap ups for them. <laughs> It takes a while. So I hope you enjoyed that. It wasn't really a super speedy wrap up, was it? I don't really think I can call them that anymore, but it was a super attempt at a speedy wrap up. It wasn't a speedy wrap up at all. I'm sorry. It was just kind of a vague wrap up, but I hope you enjoyed it. If you did enjoy it, please do give this video a thumbs up. Comment down below what you read this month. Subscribe to see more of my face on your feed. And if you want to help pick the books that I end up reading, whether it's through book club or Patreon dedicated reading vlogs, I have my Patreon link down below where I will be posting much more content coming very soon, including some exciting live shows and things. So yay! Thank you guys so much for watching. Keep smiling and stay positive.